Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Global Physical Geography, Geography 3850. Um, this isn't exactly the way I was hoping to uh, start the uh, term. Um, this is officially uh, lecture slot number three, but this is the first time I'm interacting with you. And unfortunately it is um, asynchronous. So we're not a real time lecture as I would have liked, <clears throat> but um, about one and a half weeks now with uh, COVID, uh, kids are still at home and uh, you might hear them running around upstairs if they have the energy for it. And also my, uh, my wife is also off with, uh, with COVID. So uh, we're not in a great shape right now. Um, <clears throat> not as bad as it could be. We're in hospital, um, but still not feeling that great and uh, certainly not in uh, good shape for a real time lecture. <clears throat> so um, we'll just see how this goes. So what I'd like to do uh, today is orient you to the class and uh, the, the objectives of the course, uh, some of the topics that we'll cover, and the evaluation criteria. I'll um, start off by introducing myself and, and some of the um, motivation uh, for this course. Uh, if we were live, of course, I would also introduce the teaching assistant, Benya, uh, Benya Hushaka, who you will uh, interact with. Um, probably mostly in, um, in Moodle, um, but also hopefully in the classroom. Uh, and we would normally have a bit of a round table, but we're going to have to um, leave the uh, in-class introductions to the um, in-person, which I hope will be next Tuesday. Uh, so what I'd like to do to uh, start off <clears throat> is give you a few anecdotes, actually, um, that go from uh, early childhood experiences all the way through to um, uh, a project that we're potentially uh, going to embark on next summer if things work out, um, and a range of experiences in between. I won't spend a lot of time on these. It could uh, each one could be a lecture in itself, really. Um, but but my um, intent here is to illustrate how my own uh, understanding of geographic uh, connections um, uh, and my horizons have broadened over the course of my life, and and that's one of the things that I'm hoping we can uh, try to accelerate. Uh, through this course. Um, <clears throat> now, in, indeed, the motivation for this uh, course uh, started uh, last summer, actually, when I was sat with our chair, Craig Coburn. We were sat in my backyard uh, in the pergola, in our swings, um, having a glass of wine and, and talking about our program. And one of the things that we uh, observed was that the geography program has a lot of individual specialized courses, of course, um, but what we don't have at the end is a capstone to kind of bring things together. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've got all of these streams, you know, in my case, but hydrology, there's other courses, uh, GIS, remote sensing, specialization, soils, geomorphology, glaciology, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of um, specialist areas that all kind of uh, branch out from Geography 1000. <clears throat> but ideally, what it would be nice to do, if we could, is kind of bring things back together into a capstone. So the, so the original impetus for this course was a fourth year offering, um, fairly small group, uh, where we would um, revise some of the concepts that have been learned in all of the uh, geography courses, or, or most of them, um, and just put it all together. I mean, geography is fundamentally a holistic um, topic, and uh, that's what we would like to emphasize. Now, of course, this is a third year offering, and it's a little bit more... Uh, open uh, than, um, than what we had originally envisaged uh, in that, of course, not all of you are geography majors or, or even environmental science majors. Um, so there is some uh, variety. Um, now, that's a good thing. Um, but what it does mean is I can't assume that you've all exclusively taken geography uh, courses or, or ENVS courses. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, okay. <clears throat> now, as to my own... Um, understanding of geographic connections and expanding horizons, which I hope will provide some context. Uh, one of the first things um, that I think of, if I you know, <laughs> dig deeply into my own uh, memory, is, you know, childhood vacations. Those are one of the things that, that I guess uh, many of us um, would uh, refer to as our earliest memories. And, and for me, one thing that stands out is that they all seem to have water associated with them, whether, whether it was walking through towns along a canal towpath or a, a river uh, frontage, or whether it was a coastal um, you know, environment, uh, there was always water there. And I mean, of course, as a, as a little kid, I didn't think too, too much about that. Um, but I do remember this, this uh, connection between vacations and water. 
um, many of whom probably have similar recollections. Um, <clears throat> and of course, I didn't think deeply or intellectually about that, but, but that uh, connection was definitely there. Moving on into my uh, formal education, um, I would uh, think back to my first year in geography. Now, first year uh, in high school is what in North America we would refer to as grade five, grade six. And of course, I was in the UK, so a slightly different educational system. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, let's call it grade five. And that's where I first took geography as a, as a, as a formal course. And, um, and of course, in, in that uh, course, we learned about uh, settlement patterns and how very often all settlements were either along the coastline, you know, um, the seaside, as I would call it when I was a kid, um, or along rivers. <clears throat> and there's logical reasons for that. You know, our natural resources uh, and, and navigation um, are more accessible uh, when we're next to water, especially for older and older um, settlements. So there's this logical connection between habitation, settlements, uh, and water. Uh, so, you know, connections are starting to be made, maybe not at a particularly sophisticated level uh, in grade five. Um, but moving forwards now to um, my fourth year high school, which would be about grade nine. Then we started to look at these patterns uh, and movements um, uh, of human behavior and, and natural process in the landscape in a, in a slightly more systematic uh, fashion. And, and some of these topics that we learned then, um, you would have covered in Geography 1000 and in other courses, university courses since then. Um, but, but one of the things that really um, sticks out, of course, is, is learning why, um, you know, why we have this affinity to water. Now, of course, as humans, we are... Uh, you know, very much comprised of water. Um, we can't go very long without water. So it's, it's a, a natural resource that we're 100% dependent on for life. But also it plays a role in many, many other um, aspects of, uh, of our daily lives and, and long-term settlement patterns. Um, <clears throat> and, and so uh, was in that grade nine course where we learned a little bit more about that. So for example, I think we had a, a field course. Um, we... Uh, visited a, a, a flour mill um, as one example. We um, visited some um, canals. And so we learned a little bit about how water was used for power and how that was important in, in the expansion of uh, agricultural uh, processing and, and uh, food security uh, within regions in, in the UK and, and how canals were used to transport goods. You know, so these are some of the things that we're starting to learn about uh, our human connection to the landscape and, and, and uh, water um, uh, conduits across the landscape. Uh, and of course, we also learned about physical processes. So, you know, some concepts about hydrology, uh, geology, and um, how uh, the flow of water behaved differently in different parts of the landscape, uh, how sometimes water would flow beneath the ground. And so we learned a little bit about groundwater. And so some of these fairly rudimentary physical processes were starting to be taught and, and we started to learn about them. And so from my um, <clears throat> early high school days, I was starting to learn about uh, how geography was quite complicated. <laughs> you know, there were these physical elements, there were these human elements, and there were these all of these interconnections. And, uh, and it really did start to seem quite uh, complex, uh, but also extremely holistic. Um, so yeah, that was one of the things that struck me I learned about grade nine. And so that passion for geography stayed with me. And eventually, um, after a couple of years hiatus in engineering, uh, I moved over to, um, geography at the university of Manchester and took that as a degree. And so that, that's really what set me on the track, uh, that I'm on now and, and why I'm a geography professor at the university of Lethbridge, I guess, ultimately, um, but during my undergrad, <clears throat> this passion for uh, water and, and mountains and, uh, and physical geography led me into uh, studying glacial hydrology in Switzerland. And, uh, and this further reinforced my notions of this holistic nature of our relationship with the landscape. Um, one of the reasons that this research was of interest was because uh, Grand Exence, the hydroelectric power uh, authority in Switzerland, um, did at that point, this was in the, the early 90s, have some concerns about glacial losses and how this would impact um, water resources, power generation, um, and also some interest in sediment fluxes and how that could impact the um, uh, passageways, the un subterranean passageways that we used in the hydroelectric power stations. So there are, there are a number of practical reasons why we were um, involved in this research. And so my uh, supervisor then, uh, Dr. David Collins, 
every year I took a number of undergraduates out to Switzerland. And so I did this every year. I spent three field seasons in the Swiss Alps, living on a glacier, making measurements, uh, having a lot of fun. I mean, it was a bit of an adventure um, and, and learning a lot about this, uh, the, the holistic interplay between, uh, you know, the humans, uh, our dependence on the environment and the various resources, whether it's water, whether it's power <clears throat> uh, and, and how that was used to support irrigation and other uh, facets of the, of the human environment. So it, it was very tightly intertwined. And, uh, and I learned a lot during that time. And then, you know, fast forward to the end of my undergraduate degree, um, David Collins, again, uh, my, my supervisor, uh, let, let me know about uh, opportunities to do research in the Canadian Rockies that had a similar uh, theme, uh, glacial water resources, um, but not for hydropower this time. Uh, not to say hydropower isn't a thing in the Rockies, of course it is. Um, but, but the main reason for, the, for this need um, to do this kind of research was more for um, <clears throat> water resources, more for irrigation and food security, ultimately. And so I came to Canada and, and started to look at uh, glacial losses in the Bow, um, in the Bow Basin, uh, specifically in the headwaters around the Wapter ice fields. And, uh, and it was my objective to understand how over the last half century or so at that time, um, the uh, glacial recession had impacted water resources, and then make some inferences about how that could impact uh, future water resources. So, you know, that kind of set me on a path to uh, uh, diving more deeply into uh, Western Canadian issues um, and um, high mountain environments and, and just understanding the, again, more of the human interaction with the physical environment. While I started doing my uh, or rather at the end of my master's, beginning of my PhD on the same theme, water resources in the Rockies, um, I was um, alerted to uh, another PhD student working in the States, uh, Ohio State University, Brian Mark, who was working in Peru on a very similar topic to me, but in the Andes, not the Canadian Rockies. And so we started a correspondence. Uh, this was about 1996. So I think it was a letter correspondence at first, couple of phone calls and anyway in one of these um, communications we uh, hit upon the idea that hey we should have a field trip down to Peru together and so at the end of 97 uh, beginning of 98 we both traveled down to Peru and did some reconnaissance uh, in the Andes around um, Boraz uh, and down to um, uh, Yanomarai and um, uh, the um, Sorry, I forgot the name now. But anyway, <laughs> a part of the Andes near to Cuzco. And so we spent uh, around about a month just touring around and um, learned. I, I mean, for me, it was a real um, uh, eye-opening experience because this was my first uh, exploration into a part of the world that wasn't as developed as, the, as Europe um, or North America. And um, we had a lot of interactions with uh, villagers in the mountains, uh, even, even got held up. Uh, by a couple of girls who demanded uh, sweets and pills from us. And uh, the consequences for our non-compliance were quite deathly, apparently. And so we had to take it seriously. Anyway, that's another story. It was quite funny. Um, and while we were there, we also toured uh, some of the downstream environments on the coast. And uh, it was an El Nino year. <clears throat> so while we were there, we saw the impacts of El Nino, uh, the impacts on the fisheries, uh, floods, um, earthquake impacts from the summer before. And there was just a rich tapestry of uh, physical and human geography experiences, uh, the kind of thing that you, you just couldn't possibly pay for in an eco tour and you, you couldn't fully appreciate in a course. Um, you kind of had to live it to, uh, to understand it. So it was, um, for me, it was a very rapid acceleration, my comprehension of uh, physical human geography interactions. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, that reinforced to me the holistic nature of geography, why for me it's the most important uh, discipline. <laughs> um, of course, I'm biased. So anyway, uh, fast forward to uh, today, and so what are, what are we working on in my lab today? Well, I think some of you have probably looked at the uh, uh, Eyes of Artemis um, video that I sent uh, last week. It's a short 20 minute presentation, which gives you an, uh, an overview of some of the things we've got going on in the lab. Um, but one of, the, one of the big topics, sticking with this theme of water and and the mountains is we've been looking at snowpack in the uh, in the old man and the bow uh utilizing uh, remote sensing particularly airborne lidar technology and uh how this relates to vegetation changes 
And so we're looking at the feedbacks in the systems, feedbacks between snow and water and vegetation. So the feedback is how these things uh, influence one another uh, and how that has changed in the past and how that's likely to change in the future. And even more recently, we've started to bring fires into the mix, how uh, the return interval of fires are impacting vegetation, how that's impacting water resources, and, and so on and so forth. So the more complexity you add, um, the more sophisticated your understanding of the overall system uh, has to become. And so what this uh, leads to is the adoption of what's known as a system science approach. And so that's one of the uh, tools that we utilize in, uh, in geography today, is system science. So that's one of the things we're going to look at in this course. Now, uh, and the, the, what I've just described is kind of the theme in, in, in my lab, and we'll probably touch on that here and there in the course, although this course is not about that, but of course, that's what I bring. And so I will lean on it because it's what I know. Um, but over the last year, <clears throat> one of the uh, human elements uh, that has really come to the fore, uh, particularly in terms of this feedback, in terms of you know, understanding outputs and inputs into the system, um, is that of mines. And of course, as you know, uh, the government is currently going through a review of the uh, coal policy for the eastern slopes. And so uh, for us, this has become uh, quite a, a tangible concept, something that we can't ignore anymore. Um, I've done a little bit of research on this, on the impacts of mines and how that would um, uh, influence changes to uh, runoff and, and how that um, feeds into uh, questions of uh, water licensing. And it's, uh, again, a very complex issue. It's not the kind of topic where you can instantly come to a conclusion. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, this is really one of the problems and one of the, one of the motivations for the course uh, when Craig Coburn and I were talking about this last summer <clears throat> was that if you look at social media, there's no end of opinions on, out there on, on any particular topic, you know, whether it's an environmental topic, a political topic, uh, any kind of geography topic, no end of opinions. And, and there is no shortage of people willing to come to very uh, quick conclusions about complex topics without a deep appreciation for the holistic nature of the subject matter that they're dealing with. Uh, and this is a problem. And so this is one of the things that we were hoping this course could address is uh, you know, to, to nurture this holistic understanding of, uh, of the subject material of, of geography, physical geography in particular, um, and to maybe um, help uh, prevent us from jumping to conclusions based on pre-existing value systems. You know, we all have different value systems and, and, and that's okay. Um, as humans, we can't say there is a right or a wrong value system um, but more or less people might tend towards one value system or another for, for whatever reasons. Um, but that's one thing that we have to appreciate is that sometimes our conclusions are more based on our value systems than they are the facts or the evidence of the subject that we're, we're looking at. <clears throat> and very often we, look, we, we seek out confirmation bias, right? We look for evidence that supports um, our existing value system. So that's one of the things that in the sciences we try to avoid, right? We try to avoid those those biases or those tendencies to seek out evidence that supports our existing values and, um, <clears throat> and, and hopefully uh, work towards objectivity. Anyway, so that's one of the things we try and do, do with this course. Now, I, I just want to leave you with one final anecdote um, before I move on with, um, with some of the structure of the course. Uh, and that is a, a, at the moment or over the last few months and into the next few months, um, we're currently looking at a project uh, in Egypt now, I don't know if this is going to happen, and to be honest, uh, recent events are suggesting that it may not happen now. Uh, but what we have been looking at is utilizing our own lab technology, our own airborne laser mapping technology, uh, to map parts of the floodplain of the Nile in Egypt. And um, the reason for this, uh, some of you may know, is because of the Grand Renaissance Dam uh, in the headwaters of the Blue Nile in, uh, in Ethiopia. Now, that dam uh, has been uh, built uh, to provide hydropower and, and I guess some um, flow regulation on the Nile uh, within uh, Ethiopia. And uh, it's extremely important for Ethiopia's development. But the problem, of course, for downstream users is that it creates some uncertainty um, over the reliability of the flow uh, in, in the Blue Nile. And so this has caused some controversy and, and tension between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. And in fact, there's 
you know, just do a quick Google search on it. You'll see that there's even been the, the talk of possible war. And uh, you may have heard in other courses uh, dealing with natural resources, <clears throat> how uh, uh, with climate change, uh, with population growth, with resource depletion, resource exhaustion, um, there are uh, uh, there is an inevitable expectation for increased geopolitical tension. Um, and so in the Nile, what we're seeing is uh, a very clear example of this playing out right now. You know, water is perhaps, well, it is the single most important resource for human life for many, many reasons. Um, but it's very often the most undervalued, uh, given its importance. And so here we see a, a situation where we've got three nations um, all having different needs for that resource, whether it's for irrigation, whether it's for power, uh, whether it's for water supply, uh, or whether it's even for navigation, um, as in, is in the case in Egypt, uh, the Nile has historically been used as a, as a navigation pathway. So all of these uh, needs uh, for that riverine resource um, are potentially threatened um, as a result of rapid filling of the, uh, of the Grand Renaissance Dam Reservoir. Whether or not those problems will occur, we're not 100% sure of. Um, there are a number of articles written about this, uh, but this is a situation that's playing out in real time. And so my lab was called upon by uh, a close colleague of mine who is a professor at Ryerson University, but also uh, in uh, works in Egypt. Um, and, uh, and so uh, he asked us if we could help with some of the mapping activities along the Nile, because they, they want to have some understanding about, well, if the flows do reduce, what will the impact be on uh, the navigability of the Nile and on the, uh, the discharges on the Nile? So as I say, that, that may or may not happen. It's kind of on uh, ice right now. Um, but uh, it's, it's an interesting example where we bring together these, you know, the understanding of hydrology, geomorphology, uh, climatology, um, but also the geopolitical elements related to the, 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 the use and the need of that resource and how that could potentially uh, propagate uh, a warlike situation. <clears throat> All of this is geography, and, um, and these are some of the kind of issues that, that we can deal with. Um, and you have to tread lightly with this kind of research, right? You know, it's uh, the, the implications uh, or consequences of getting things wrong um, could be quite severe. So we, uh, uh, we need to be objective and we need to be cautious with this kind of research. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, so those are some anecdotes. Hopefully these anecdotes uh, reinforce for you where I'm coming from, you know, why we want to do this kind of a course. This is not a thematic course, right? This is not a hydrology course. It's not a weather and climate course. It's not a geomorphology course. It's not a remote sensing course, you know, and so on and so forth. It's not any of those specific courses, but it is a course that I hope will draw from what you have learned in all such courses. <clears throat> and of course, courses that are outside of geography. That's the one thing that's wonderful about geography as a discipline is it draws from everything. Um, and so anything you've learned in any course, I hope will be relevant here. Now, okay, so I wanna get into some of the mechanics of the course. So um, first of all, <clears throat> What does this course not do? Uh, okay, well, what it doesn't do is teach you new knowledge. Now, that might sound strange. It also doesn't train new skills. That also might sound strange. Most courses at university teach knowledge or they train skills, right? And, and that's what many of you go into a course and expect. Well, yes, I hope you'll learn something from this course, of course. Uh, but new knowledge and new skills are not the point. What I am hoping you'll get out of this course, what is my ambition for you, is that you will reinforce knowledge that you have gained elsewhere, and you'll be able to bring it together, and that you will practice skills that you have learned elsewhere and refine them and make them better. And, uh, yeah, okay, so that's a little bit on what the course doesn't do. So what, what does this course attempt to do? Uh, okay, well, before I tell you uh, what I'm hoping to achieve with this course, um, I just want to uh, refer back to the best course I ever took in university. Uh, it was a geography and planning course at the University of Waterloo during my graduate days, and it was a 100% team-based course over two whole semesters, 
very unusual. Most courses are one semester. This was a two semester course and it wasn't a lecture based course. It wasn't a lab based course. There was no exam at the end. Um, it was 100% project based, 100% team based. In fact, the most annoying uh, component of this course for everyone in the class, and I think it was about 15 of us, the most annoying component of this course was that we all had to agree on day one to share the same grade. So uh, if, if the class failed, we were all going to fail, regardless of how well we thought we did individually. Um, or if we excelled, we were all going to get an A. Um, and of course, that is annoying to some people if you think there's one or two slackers in the class that don't pull their weight. Of course, so there was this, this sense from the outset that there's going to be some in inequity here. But anyway, uh, it ultimately ended up being the best course um, that I personally ever took at university. And it was in wetlands um, and uh, wetland management. So there was development of process understanding, uh, policy understanding, um, and uh, it was a very holistic course. Uh, we did field work. We uh, wrote a report. We conducted a public consultation. But every week... We were talking, we were presenting, we were engaged. And, and that's the critical element that I want to emphasize here. We were engaged. This was, as far as I was concerned, uh, back in 1995, 96, this was the epitome of active learning. Now, active learning is when the, you know, the student is engaged in the whole process and uh, you're not learning passively, right? You're not just trying to absorb knowledge that has been thrown around or or spoken to you, or you know, you're you're engaged in the learning process, and so uh, I'm, I'm not going to reproduce that course. I I can't really reproduce that course for a lot of <laughs> reasons. Uh, we're not really set up to do that. Um, but I would like to, as best as I possibly can, reproduce some of the critical elements of that course um, that I hope will benefit you. So now, what does that mean? <clears throat> okay, what that means is I want to. Um, help you nurture, or I wish to help nurture an appreciation for the connections across natural and human systems. I would like to discourage binary thinking. You know, that's polarization thinking. This is what we see in social media all the time. I want to discourage that type of thinking and acknowledge the complexity of systems and values. Now, that might seem a little bit esoteric, but that's one of my goals. Uh, I would like to motivate uh, motivate your revision and application of concepts learned in previous geography and environmental science courses. I wish to enable your freedom to explore topics that are of interest to you, i.e. I don't wish to apply a highly prescriptive set of topics. I'm, I'm providing structure, um, but you have a lot of freedom over the topics that you wish to explore. <clears throat> And finally, I'd like to apply an uh, active learning techniques uh, throughout this course. What that means is you will be doing most of the learning. You will be doing the work to learn, right? Uh, I can't teach unless you learn. There's, I, uh, maybe you've come across this in other courses, but there's this concept that, uh, or the, there's this false concept that teaching is what we do when we lecture. Or teaching is what we do when we uh, establish labs um, and, and then evaluate them and so on and so forth. No, those are the mechanics of teaching, but that's not teaching. Teaching is when you learn. And part of the problem for us as teachers is that we only have so much control over the learning process. You have more control over the learning process. We can enable learning, but you are responsible for your learning. And so that's why I'd like to apply uh, active learning as much as we possibly can, because it shifts the responsibility for learning under your shoulders and away from my shoulders. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm going to walk away and leave you to it. No, what it means is I play more a role as facilitator uh, than lecturer or instructor. Um, hopefully that'll become clear as we, as we go through the course. Okay, so now specifically to objectives, <clears throat> I've got two uh, high-level objectives for this course. The first is to expand knowledge in physical geography through the study of global examples. Pretty broad objective, right? So there's a lot of, uh, lot of freedom there. Now, but let's look at some of the details that, that lie beneath that objective. So we'd like to draw on the fundamentals of geography from other courses. 
I say geography and environmental sciences, but of course, as you know, there are some subtle differences between geography and ENVS. Geography, of course, is more um, holistic uh, and, and integrative. Uh, and, and that's where we're going to uh, utilize a, a kind of a systems approach, which I'll explain later. Um, okay, I would also like to uh, disentangle the complexity and organize the connections. This is what I would like you to do with any topic that you address. Try and disentangle the complexity and organize the connections. <clears throat> um, now, this is a physical geography course, so clearly the emphasis is on physical, the physical environment. Um, but this is also more generally a geography course. So I would like you to always be aware of the human environment and where the connections are, um, where the connections are to the physical environment. And I, the most, I think, obvious connection would be for you to answer the question, why do we care? So if you're uh, looking at a particular um, aspect of physical geography, let's say it's hydrology, for example, uh, ask yourself, why do we care about this? Well, in hydrology, we care because water is, you know, we, we are mostly water. We can't live very long um, without taking water on as a, as a biological entity. We have to drink water. We need it. Um, but also we use water in so many aspects of life. So we care about hydrology. It's not just some academic discipline. We need to know this information. Right, to advance as a civilization, to survive as a species, this is information that we need to know. So we care about it. So I want you to be aware of these connections. Why do we care as humans? You know, what are the connections? Might not be about uh, living as an organism. It could be that we care because we want to prevent a war, or we care because it impacts the economy, and so on and so forth. Um, I'd like you to relate whatever uh, you do in this course to contemporary events in geography. So, you know, world events. Climate change is one that's around us, uh, the economy, war, terrorism, uh, natural resources, so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. There's always stuff going on, right? So, I mean, you, you, you can't watch the news um, and not relate what you see in the news to geography. It's, well, I'd, I'd argue it's impossible. Um, so be aware of those connections uh, and always uh, draw the connections to world events or, or dig deeply, more deeply into certain world events. Uh, now, this one might be a little bit esoteric. I don't know, but I want you to practice using uh, a systems science approach or a, or a systems approach. This uh, is something that I'll talk a little bit more about in the next lecture. Um, most of you or all of you, if you've taken Geography 1000, which should be a prereq, um, and if you've taken many other EMVS courses, you should know what systems science is and what systems approaches are. Uh, we'll look a little bit more into that next week, um, but maybe just be aware of that. If you're not familiar with those concepts, just go Google them, look into it. You know, ask yourself, what is systems science? And what is a systems approach? Um, and yeah, and, and finally, again, drawing from Geography 1000, uh, I want you to demonstrate an understanding of the connections between uh, the four spheres in geography. So the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, lithosphere, biosphere. Okay, so let's, let's uh, look at how we can connect those. So that's a lot of sub-objectives, but that all fund, falls under the one major objective of expanding knowledge in physical geography through the study of global examples. <clears throat> okay, now the second objective, and there are only two, is that I wish to refine your most valuable skill or the most valuable skill um, that you will get at university. I wonder if you know what that is. Okay, well, oral communication. Now, to be honest, I might not be doing a particularly great job of it right now. I really do hate speaking to the camera when there's when you get no feedback of an audience. It's it's not something I feel particularly comfortable with, um, and I don't feel particularly great right now anyway. But it is an important skill. Um, as lecturers, we have to lecture, you know. So we're quite comfortable standing at the front of a classroom or in a theatre and and, uh, and and presenting. It, it's something we do. Um, but may, maybe as, a, as an anecdote, um, I, I remember my second year geography, uh, I had to give a presentation 
in front of uh, my class. It wasn't the first ever presentation I'd had to give, but it was the first one I had to give to maybe 30 or 40 people. And it was the first one that was evaluated. And what made it worse was it was a, it was a two-person presentation. It was a team project. And uh, I really don't remember the topic. I don't remember the other individual very, very well. But I do remember that he and I didn't really get along, <laughs> didn't see eye to eye over the topic. And I felt like I did most of the work. And, and so it was just all around a bad scene. And, and we hadn't been able to get together until maybe half an hour before we had to give the presentation. So you, you can imagine this presentation was going to be a disaster. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we got up. We didn't have PowerPoint. We were using flip, flip charts or paper and, and a marker pen. And I remember scribbling on the marker pen, uh, on, on the paper that, uh, well, this was our understanding of the problem, kind of a scribble. And then I made some really, I look back on it now, and it was just a dumb statement that for whatever reason I thought was funny at the time. Uh, and I just made the scribble even worse. And I said, and this is our understanding of it now. And then I proceeded to give a 10 minute presentation that was the most embarrassing, disastrous thing I think I've ever done in my life. And then we sat down and I think the instructor was, obviously displeased with us uh, and my partner i think maybe spent some total of 30 seconds speaking but really saying next to nothing i mean honestly it was a disaster you cannot imagine a worse public presentation <clears throat> than the one that we gave uh and it was embarrassing and it was hard work uh okay it was embarrassing and hard work because we weren't practiced at public speaking we, we didn't have much experience with it um, but, you know, the real reason it was embarrassing and painful was because we didn't practice. You know, we didn't actually know what we were going to talk about. And there's nothing worse than standing in front of a, an expectant audience and not having a clue what you're going to talk about. Now, the more practiced you are and the more knowledgeable and you, are, you are in a particular discipline, and, and then you can start to do that, you know, like... A, with my hydrology lectures, for example, I could probably go into any of my lectures and ramble on any of the topics that I have to talk about because I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, mm. But 20 years ago, I certainly couldn't have done that. So you know, uh, knowing your subject matter is essential and practice is essential. <clears throat> and the more you do these things, the better you get um, at it. Uh, okay, so, so that's a little bit, uh, that's kind of anecdotal, but why is this important? Okay, well, I call it the most valuable skill you'll learn in university because, yeah, you'll get a degree. That degree will tell the world that you've got a certain proficiency. You know, you've got a qualification that proves to the world you've taken certain courses, you have certain knowledge, and you probably have certain skills. Yeah, that's all great on paper. But you probably have to interview. Um, at some point in your life, you're probably going to have to sell ideas, maybe even sell products, maybe even convince a team or convince a supervisor that your ideas are better than somebody else's. Uh, I, I don't know, but it doesn't matter what you're going to do. Your success uh, will be enhanced or your opportunities for success will be improved the better you are at publicly sharing your ideas through oral communication. That's a given. Um, and it, it's worked for me. I've just given you one anecdote as to where I did a really lousy job in a public presentation, second year university, terrible job. And, and really that's one of the very few memories I have <laughs> uh, of my second year undergrad, other than doing great field work and other fun stuff and learning some great things about the mountains and hydrology. But uh, the, the only reason I remember that is because it invoked in me such an intense emotion, uh, you know, such an intense feeling of pain and embarrassment. Uh, and these things stay with us. Now, <clears throat> on the flip side, uh, two or three years ago, actually, I'm going to make this story a little bit longer. Um, I, I wrote a proposal for Alberta Innovators, about a half a million dollar proposal. I had previously been successful with Alberta Innovates over a number of years. Um, and honestly, I thought that this proposal was a slam dunk. Uh, the, the lab was well set up. We'd, we'd been very successful in the outputs of our previous research. We'd graduated a number of students. 
Um, we'd answered all the questions that we set out to answer. <clears throat> and, and, and I thought we were in good shape. Anyway, a uh, proposal was uh, written with a lot of work, uh, submitted, and I said it was about a half million dollar proposal for a three year funding envelope. Um, but then it failed. And I'll admit I was shocked because when I got the feedback from the, from the funding agency, it didn't really make a lot of sense. And, and reading between the lines, uh, I, I realized that it was actually kind of a political, practical um, failure. It wasn't, it wasn't that we failed because the ideas weren't good or that the project wasn't implementable. It failed because ultimately the funding agency had to make some tough decisions. And there was a, a proposal from the University of Lethbridge that had some overlap with a proposal from the University of Alberta and even though neither one was materially better or worse than the other, and they weren't really doing exactly the same thing, but they would have worked in the same general area and answer some of the same questions, but in very different ways. Um, and, and so instead of funding both, uh, there were financial limitations. And of course, there were some politics. We can never avoid the politics. And for specific reasons that I really won't know, um, they made the decision to fund University of Alberta and not the University of Lethbridge. Okay, that's water under the bridge, but it was quite disappointing at the time. So uh, a few months after that, <clears throat> I had to give a presentation to the same agency, Alberta Innovates. There's about, uh, I can't remember, 60 or 70 people in the room. Um, and there's a lot of government people, a lot of industry people, a number of academics. And uh, I thought, well, I could give a presentation on, on our work. And, you know, I was a little bit disappointed. I could be a little bit bitter about this uh, and uh, to say, well, okay, I'm presenting on everything that we have done. And hey, you know what? We're not going to be doing anymore because you guys aren't funding us now. Well, that wouldn't be a very good strategy, but that's kind of how I felt. Uh, anyway, so I, I didn't do that. I thought, you know what? I'm going to put together a really excellent presentation such that they're going to feel bad for not funding us. So what I did was I interviewed all the students in my lab, um, put together a really good presentation, demonstrated how our research could support policy. And, uh, and basically, I communicated to the, to, the, to the group or to the funding agency that uh, we were a very good bet financially, that we were very cost effective at using public money um, to come up with good research outputs, good results, whether it's graduating students, whether it's um, understanding water resources problems and coming up with solutions for operational monitoring, you know, that we were good at that uh, and we were very cost effective. <clears throat> now, after that uh, proposal, uh, I got lots of feedback and uh, like positive feedback and encouragement to work on other projects. And so ultimately other funding and other opportunities came from that. Uh, and then, Interestingly, just this week, uh, I was uh, awarded more than the funding that we lost two years ago to basically carry on and do similar research uh, from Alberta Innovates. And so um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if I hadn't made that public presentation and I hadn't presented it in a, in a very positive light, um, the funding that I just received this week wouldn't have happened. Uh, the other opportunities and connections uh, that have been made over the last two years uh, wouldn't have came so easily. And so that's one example where if you do a good job with a public presentation, it can really open up a lot of doors. And so there's no, uh, there's never, uh, well, no, sorry. Um, it's never too soon, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, to, to practice those kind of skills. And so this course is going to lean heavily on presentation skills. And so I'll, I'll give you some of the structure of that in a minute. Um, but, but essentially what that means is engage in class discussion, you know, develop your argumentative skills. And I don't mean shouting at one another, you know, that kind of negative argument. I mean, you know, rhetorical argument, develop your uh, reasoning skills and articulation skills in, uh, in class discussions. I also want you to deliver a targeted video report, just you know, one person uh, report on a technical or scientific content. So just a short talk. Then to deliver a real-time speech in class, which is intended to share 
your ideas and compel others to uh, accept your ideas. And then finally, to work as a team to deliver a video news clip, which is um, essentially an event report, uh, kind of like in, in, on the TV news. So, so those are the two objectives, expand knowledge and physical geography through the study of global examples and to revi- refine your most valuable skill that you will learn at university, which is oral communication. <clears throat> if you can uh, finish this course, having made progress on those two objectives, then that will be a uh, success as far as I'm concerned. Um, I guess I've told you why, uh, why I'd like to do that. Now, um, so mechanically, why this approach? So, well, first of all, when you speak on a topic, uh, th- this, is, uh, this is an example of active learning, right? Because when you speak publicly, you are motivated to learn the subject material to avoid embarrassment or to avoid a poor grade. Now, when we're writing out an assignment like an essay, <clears throat> that's also active learning, right? That's also a very good way to learn material very good way to organize material, um, but it doesn't have the embarrassment factor. It doesn't have the public um, public display, uh, you know, the, the real-time feedback um, that, a, that a, a speech or a presentation does. <clears throat> and, and so in a way, um, it's not anonymous, but it's a little bit more anonymous. You know, and you're a little bit less accountable when you're writing material. You are still accountable, but you're not getting that real, real-time real feedback. And so given you know you will be getting real-time feedback in a public presentation, uh, you are motivated to learn the material and to understand it. At least that's the theory. I mean, you can, of course, go into a public presentation and not care, um, but most people do care. And most people uh, want to know what they're talking about, or at least appear to know what they're talking about. Secondly, when you give a presentation, you are studying it, you are preparing the talk, i.e. organizing the talk, and you have to deliver it. So those are three steps. And so that's what I would like to call, it's triple reinforcement of the learning process. Now, it parallels a written work, but it's this element of delivery that really reinforces things. Um, and it also uh, reinforces the skill itself, not just the learning. It reinforces the skill, the rhetorical skill, and the organizational skills of putting your thoughts together. When you write things, right, you don't, you don't have to write in one go, right? You don't have to write the introduction, the methods, the conclusions, or whatever, whatever it is you're writing. You don't have to write from start to finish. You know, very often, um, very often I'll write my results first. Then I'll go back to the methods. Then I'll go to the conclusions. Then I'll go to the introduction. So for me, writing a paper is a very non-linear process, but we read it in a very linear or logical fashion. So um, the point I'm trying to make there is that when you write something, you are not necessarily forced to think logically, right? Because you can write out of order, even though you know it will be received in a certain logical sequence, you don't have to put it together in that logical sequence. Now, when you present something, however, we're constrained by time or the linearity of time, right? And so we have to present in a logical sequence when we present orally, right? It's not so easy to flip backwards and forwards um, when you've got a five or a 10 or a 20 minute presentation period. So that forces you to think logically for that moment. And so it's a different way to think of the material. And uh, again, it reinforces the learning process in a slightly different way. And of course, as I've already said, it develops your rhetorical skills uh, or your argumentative skills. So that's why um, in this course, we're leaning heavily on presentation. Okay, and uh, and, and, and as, as I've already said, I think this is a good thing for you to do because these are skills that will uh, stay with you for life. <laughs> I mean, you know, a couple of years after university, you might end up finding yourself working in, I don't know, you might be a merchant banker. You know, you might, might be in sales, in executive sales. You might be in re- executive recruitment. I mean, who knows where you'll end up? But what you've learned in geography or ENVS or any other course, um, the subject material could actually become somewhat immaterial uh, to your success in whatever you 
ultimately end up doing. But your oral presentation skills and rhetorical skills and organizational skills that you learn at university will stay with you regardless of what you do in the future. Uh, okay, uh, let's think a little bit about the course outline. So uh, the first half of the course up to reading week, it's going to be uh, lectures, in-class discussion. Um, <clears throat> we've lost a good chunk of the first week, so we'll really start next week, I hope, um, with an interactive Zoom class for the first uh, couple of lectures next week, uh, where I'll present some materials. I'll probably talk a little bit about some of my Eastern Slopes work and expand out to beyond our work into some of the more general topics on the Eastern Slopes. I'll start there because it's, you know, it's close to home, something we're all fairly familiar with. Then um, uh, what I would like to do is I present for, I don't know, a quarter or half of the lecture, something like that, um, maybe in blocks. Um, but I really want to see a lot of um, in engagement in, in class discussion. So uh, what I'll tell you is next week, the first lecture next week, uh, Tuesday, we'll, we'll look at some of the mechanics. We'll look at system science, uh, geographic thought, geographic themes, the geographic continuum. We'll look at some of those things. Um, then the next lecture, Thursday, we'll look at Eastern Slopes. And so before both of those lectures, I'd like you to think about those topics. Uh, do, do your own homework. I'm not going to point you to particular resources. I mean, you, you're all experts with Google now and uh, <laughs> the vast spectrum of material that you can access through the internet, through library resources. Um, so, you know, do a little bit of homework there and come to class prepared to talk uh, and ask questions and stimulate discussion. And I won't have all the answers, but, but we can discuss anything uh, in these various topic areas in the class. Moving on from next week, <clears throat> we, we might look at some Arctic case studies, uh, climate change, permafrost changes, so on and so forth. Um, after that, I think I'd like to look at South America, um, El Nino, floods, glacial changes, biodiversity, Amazonian rainforest, forest losses, so on and so forth. Um, after that, Africa, Middle East, uh, lots of natural resources questions that are of interest there. And then maybe towards the end of the semester, <clears throat> uh, maybe we'll move over to uh, Australasia, uh, drought issues, uh, wildfires, so on and so forth. So this is not a class about natural disasters, but obviously when we think of a region, some of the things that stick out are the natural disasters that have occurred in recent years. Um, but, but that's not the topic of this course. This course is not about natural disasters, uh, but we certainly won't ignore them. They, they, they will come up, as will many other aspects of uh, geography. Now, um, after reading week, this is where we move uh, pretty much exclusively over to you. So for the first four weeks after reading week, we're going to have what I would like to call mini TED Talks. That's where everybody gives their own uh, uh, in-class presentations, and we stimulate discussion on those topics. I would like to organize each one of the class on th uh, thematic topics. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week, maybe. <clears throat> Uh, then the, the last two weeks of class where we actually have classes, because uh, there won't be any exams in this, um, the last two weeks, this is where we're going to deliver the team uh, video reports. But, the, but those reports are going to be on video and uh, uploaded prior to that. But then we're going to share them in class uh, and, and discuss them. So, yeah, so first half of the course is, is me lecturing and us talking and the second half of the course is basically you presenting either in real time or by video. And then, and then we have a lot of class discussion on that. So uh, I'm sure you've all looked at the outline by now. Course evaluation has four major components. Uh, the first is course participation. <clears throat> so there's two elements there. One is in class. Uh, so there's between 30 and 40 in the class. So I'm going to have to try and get to know you all with such a high number. That can be challenging. But one thing I will tell you is if I don't know who you are at the end of the class, that's a, usually a pretty good indicator that you haven't participated very much. Those students that participate get known very quickly. Okay, so there's a hint. Um, and, and the other half of, in co of uh, course participation is Moodle. I need to think a little bit about that. But Benya is going to set up a forum and I'd like you to be proactive 
in, uh, in, in raising discussion uh, topics and responding to discussion topics uh, on the Moodle forum. Uh, now, that one's a lot more easy to be quantitative over, right? Like, you know, if the, the more posts you make, the more discussion uh, points you raise, that's going to be visible. So that's easy to see, easy to gauge. Um, and so that's worth 50% of participation. Um, but the first 50% is, is in-class participation. So really, that's where you kind of have to be proactive and speak up in order to get known. Uh, okay, uh, the, the second part is a video report. <clears throat> this is where you present uh, a five, five to six minute uh, video brief uh, and a one page or 500 word um, summary to go along with it. I mean, 500 words is very, very short. So I'm, I'm not looking for an essay here. I'm really just looking for an abstract. <coughs> uh, uh, but you will uh, do these videos individually. There's lots of freedom and flexibility over what tools you want. You know, you can use Adobe Premiere, Camtasia. Uh, you can even record on Zoom uh, and any other tools. Uh, you can use PowerPoint uh, if you want. I'm not requiring it, but it's a tool that I know you have, and it's easy to use. You can record on there. Anyway, lots of uh, lots of uh, flexibility. Um, not uh, too many slides. I mean, we'll talk more about this later on. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of that right now, um, but it, it will be uh, an evidence based presentation. You're reporting on on a topic. Uh, okay. Anyway, let's move on. Um, that's what 20%. The other uh, in-class presentation is um, a little bit different. This, this is where I'd like you to present more like a TED talk. Uh, so this is not going to be so slide heavy. This is going to be more like you're giving a speech. It's a real-time presentation, 10 to 12 minutes. I know TED talks are typically 18 minutes. Well, logistically, we don't have that much time for everyone in the class to do that. I'd like to, but it just won't fit. So that's why it's 10 to 12 minutes. And the difference uh, between this and the video report that you're doing earlier is that the TED Talk is more for you to share an idea. You know, this is where you need to basically come up with an idea and share it. You know, compel other people to share your ideas or to um, agree with a new concept or new idea that you have. Uh, it doesn't have to be earth shattering. Um, but it has to be something that's not obvious. So the, the, the first video report is basically a report on something. It could be a case study. You know, you're just reporting on something. You know, you're not necessarily uh, come up with any, any new ideas. You're sharing facts and you're informing us. Whereas in the uh, TED Talk, you're coming up with your own ideas, your own conclusions, and you're trying to compel us to believe your ideas. Okay, so there's a difference in, in style there. And, and this is where we want to be focused on you, not on slides, right? So the TED Talk is most definitely not death by PowerPoint. The five minute video could be, it could be just slide after slide after slide because you're exposing ideas, you're sharing information. The difference with the TED Talk is you're sharing ideas. You're not just sharing uh, information. Okay, now finally, the, the last uh, evaluation component is ultimately worth 40%, so it's, it's a big one. Um, but the, the, the two 20% components are uh, the uh, video and report, right? So you've got a, a video uh, presentation, which is a, a, a team, team video, and then a written report, which is a team report. And so there's nominally going to be five people per team. That may adapt slightly as the numbers in the course change. I need to check, but I think we're at about 32 registered today. I'm not sure if that's going to go up or down. <clears throat> um, but anyway, uh, team project, probably about five people. So you're going to have to work together. Uh, video is everybody delivers it March 28th. And then we uh, cycle through them in the last uh, couple of classes and we'll discuss the, uh, the content. Uh, right. Okay. So then... Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. We've talked, spoken about participation. Uh, okay, I've got a little bit more detail on your, um, on the video brief. So first of all, 
I want you to start thinking about the topic for your video brief right now. And then by the end of the month, January 28th, is when I want everyone to have told me what they would like to do their video brief on. So you got lots of uh, freedom, but I want you to let me know as soon as you have some ideas, and then we will iterate on that. Uh, it can be by email or uh, via Zoom chat, or once we're back in the classroom, it can be after class or office hours, whatever. But I, you need to interact with me on your topic and, and get that locked in by January 28th. <clears throat> you will then record a five to six minute video using medium of your choice. Uh, be a technical or scientific report on any physical geography topic. Um, and it will be accompanied by one page, 500 word abstract, uh, plus references, but the references are not on that one page or 500 words. So you could have, I don't know, five references or 20 references, whatever you, is appropriate. I'd say five is a little bit low. Um, but anyway, what, whatever it is, uh, that's outside of your 500 word, one page limit. Must demonstrate elements from course objective number one. So we've discussed that earlier. Um, so refer back to that. Uh, this point's important. You must not recycle from another course. Uh, it has happened before. And, and sometimes it's okay if you're recycling a theme and you want to build on it. I'm not so concerned about that. But when you recycle materials and content from another course or a presentation you've given in another course, strictly speaking, that is self-plagiarism. And I think you all know the consequences for plagiarism. We don't like that. So uh, I would urge you to do something original in this course. Uh, any controversial points that you raise must be supported by evidence or sound reason and logic. Uh, I'm going to have to tell you how to upload those videos to me. But what I'm thinking right now is that they will be uploaded uh, to Moodle via UJAR. Now, I know how I do that. I'm not 100% sure how you do that. So I'm, I'm going to work that out and I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but all of these video briefs need to be uploaded uh, before reading week. So that's by February the 18th. And uh, each video uh, brief will be peer reviewed, uh, which is worth 50% of the mark, and it will be re reviewed by myself. And I'll speak to you more about evaluation criteria later on once we start to think more deeply about that but i just want you to understand there will be a peer review component on moodle now for the real-time ted talk uh so i say it's around about 10 minutes uh 200 to 300 word written abstract so not a very long abstract it's kind of like a conference abstract uh the emphasis is on sharing ideas and making suggestions rather than reporting on facts uh be selective over slide use no death by PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> now, I anticipate that some of you might be passionate about a particular subject, and, and you might want to use this course to dive more deeply into that subject matter. Now, that's okay. It, it, it might be that some of you want to do a video brief and a TED-type talk on the same subject area. Now, uh, in principle, that's okay, and I will support that. Um, but you have to be careful because what I don't want to see is use of the same content, material, and arguments in the video brief as you then present in the TED Talk. I do not want to see that. But you can um, build on the, the same topic. You know, like, I, I know, let's say you're interested in water resources in South Africa. Um, you know, you, you might want to in the uh, video report, talk about some of the physical processes, some of the regional geography and some of the climatology, you know, some of the background specifications, your know, technicalities. And then maybe in the TED talk, you might want to build on that by <clears throat> um, explaining how the technicalities of the subject area influence the, the human dimension and, and maybe more why we should care about that. Uh, or maybe you want to talk about future implications or Anyway, I, I think you get the, get the idea. The talks can relate to one another. They can both belong to a broad topic or theme, um, but they cannot recycle the same content. Okay, and we, we can talk more about that later on too. Uh, okay, this, this one's important too. So uh, as with the video brief, I want you to... Uh, 
uh, let me know as soon as possible what your topic is. Now, um, you've got a little bit more freedom over, well, I mean, you could even think about this during reading week if you want, um, but there is an incentive for you to define your TED Talk topic uh, as soon as possible. Because those of you who define a topic <clears throat> with me um, can select a time to present. Now, remember, you've got the first four weeks after reading week. That's the time when you're giving these TED Talks. So you can select either, you know, right after reading week. Maybe you want to get it out the way earlier. Um, you know, I don't know what other course requirements you've got. Maybe there's a reason that you'd like to get this out the way early. So you might want to do it first week after reading week. Um, on the flip side, there might be some of you that really want more talk to time to prepare this, and maybe you want it later on in the term. So if you have a real strong desire for a particular sequence or time, then it's better to get this defined early with me, and then you can select that time. Now, that said, <clears throat> what I am going to try to do is organize talks thematically. So this is another reason why I want to know as soon as possible what the talks are going to be, or at least the themes, so that I can try and organize them thematically. So ultimately, I would appreciate your flexibility. You know, if, if you say, oh, it doesn't matter to me when I present, then that's great. I'll, I'll slot you in uh, according to theme. Um, if it does really matter to you, then it's kind of first come, first serve. You know, let me know as soon as possible whether you want early or late, and then I'll try to accommodate. But the longer you leave it, the less flexibility there's going to be. And if we get to reading week and I've still got half of the class haven't defined their, defined their TED Talk topics, then I'm just going to start assigning times. And it may even get to the point where I have to assign a topic, not the specific talk, but just assign a general topic area. And then you have to work within that. So, you know, if you have no particular passion, maybe that's OK. Maybe you'd like to have, have a time and a topic assigned. Uh, but if you have a particular passion to do something of interest to you, then be proactive. Let me know as soon as possible. Uh, as for the grading on this, I'll do that uh, myself. There won't be any uh, peer review um, on the TED Talk, but you, there will be in-class discussion and feedback. <clears throat> now, as for the news report, so uh, groups of five will work together to study and deliver the video report. Uh, on a contemporary case study topic in physical geography. So imagine you've actually got to um, put together a news report, right? You know, imagine you're a, a team and, and this is something that's going to be delivered on, you know, CBC National or something. So, uh, uh, yeah, you've got to pull together. You've got to demonstrate that you've researched it and somehow you're going to have to cycle between each of you in the, in the presentation. So we'll talk more about this uh, later on in the course. I don't have all of the answers right now. Um, but uh, what I would like you to think about, start thinking about, is which general topic areas are of interest to you. And I'm just loosely defining um, eight topic areas. So I know climate change, natural disasters, renewable energy, natural resources, environmental monitoring, food security, geopolitical conflict. So those are huge, huge topic areas. And of course, they all overlap with one another. Um, but you can choose a specific event or issue within any of those topic areas. But <clears throat> um, each team needs to do a different topic area because I, I really don't want everyone or multiple teams giving the same general topic. I, I want to get a little bit of variety in here. So videos to be uploaded to Moodle via Mark by March 28th, <clears throat> and videos reviewed and discussed in class. Um, now, as far as this course is concerned, so all of those evaluation components, uh, what I'm looking for are a number of, I, I'm looking for you to illustrate um, an understanding and proficiency within a number of concept areas. And, and we'll look at these next week. I'm not going to dive into these in any depth right now. Um, but first of all, science and scientific method, natural, physical, uh, social sciences, right? Because you know, this is a science course. So you need to demonstrate to me that you understand what that means. Um, at a, now, at another level, earth system science. Now, earth system science is a 
subscience under the natural sciences. Um, it's a particular way of doing things. And so we'll, we'll look at that. And I want you to demonstrate some understanding of that. Um, <clears throat> now, then there's the four global subsystems. This is getting back to Geography 1000. And there's the four Earth spheres. So Earth system science... Uh, the four global subsystems and the four Earth spheres are kind of interrelated. They're, they're subtly different, of course, but they're all interrelated. Uh, then there's the geographic continuum, you know, physical, the human, and all the bits of connection in between. Uh, and then there's the, the five major contemporary themes in geography. Uh, so the, these are concepts in geography uh, that I want to see you prove that you understand. You know, say, so we'll deal with these a little bit next week. Um, first of all, earth system science. So, you know, we've got concepts of open systems, closed systems, um, inputs, throughputs, outputs of energy and mass. Um, we've got feedbacks, you know, how one process influences another process and how that can then, you know, feedback and kind of uh, influence the originating process uh, in terms of um, energy and mass transfers. We've got concepts of equilibrium, uh, steady state, dynamic state, uh, equilibrium. We've got threshold events. Okay, all of these are concepts that you need to understand. Uh, I think most of you probably do already, but we're going to revise these. Um, specifically, we'll look at them, all of those concepts, next Tuesday. Um, but I want to see uh, a demonstration that you understand these concepts in, in all of your uh, <clears throat> presentation materials. Now with the Earth's four spheres, same again. Um, you need to demonstrate that you understand what they are and how they connect. So atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, biosphere. Uh, geographic continuum, physical to human geography. So metrology, glaciology, geomorphology, biogeography on the physical side, uh, behavioral, economical, historical, political, and so on and so forth. Uh, on, the, on the human side, and, and how we see connections between those. Um, and um, Okay, yeah, and again, one thing you may remember from Geography 1000, that the five themes of geography, and these relate both to physical and human. So these themes fit everywhere within the geographic continuum from the physical to the human side. And so these, these are the, the concepts of movement or displacement or region, you know, the physical and human uh, interactions and patterns in, across regions, and then human and earth relationships, uh, concepts of place, uh, concepts and measurements or, or, or cartographic representations of location. So movement, region, human earth relationships, place and location. So these are the, the five themes of geography. Um, and it, basically, Earth system science, uh, the four subsystems, the four spheres, uh, the continuum, and the themes of geography, those are the building blocks of geography. Um, and I hope at the end of this course, you've got a very solid understanding of those building blocks uh, and how we use them to understand the Earth system um and um how we put everything together how we understand the connections and the complexity of the earth system and uh yeah and if we can make some progress there then uh, we will have been successful with this course so i'm not sure how long that uh, that off the cuff speech um took but that is my um <clears throat> lecture for today uh, i do apologize that it's asynchronous uh, I didn't break down into a coughing fit, so I guess I could, in theory, give a real-time lecture, but who knows how I'm going to feel tomorrow morning, so I think this is the, <laughs> the safe approach. Um, but thanks for bear bearing with me on this, um, uh, on this uh, asynchronous video. Uh, please do look through the outline, familiarize yourself a little bit with the concepts that I've um, uh, presented today and the uh, course evaluation criteria. Uh, <clears throat> when we get together next Tuesday, we will look at the uh, underlying concepts a little bit more. Uh, I'll probably spend about half of the lecture talking about that. I won't go into a lot of depth. Um, but also, I'm uh, hoping that you will come to the lecture with some questions, questions about topics, uh, questions about the course, um, and uh, we'll have some uh, discussion on that. So uh, that's it from me for today, and I'll see you soon. Thanks a lot.